Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, like you can read on the screen, today we are here for an interesting event uh, webinar by Elemental uh, about climate responsive design. And we have with us our expert for today, uh, architect Amruta Kishore. She is, uh, I'll tell you more about her. Before uh, we know the expert, let, let's get an idea of, of what uh, we can expect in today's uh, presentation. So uh, we will look at the critical regionalism and why it is necessary. We'll go through obviously climate responsive design, deep dive into the theory. We look at what daylighting, ventilation and materiality, how these things play a role in climate responsive design. Uh, ending it with a sustainable lifestyle of how uh, maybe in day-to-day -day, uh, life we can you know adopt to different uh, new ways of doing this and yes conclusion of what we'll be learning today before getting into the topic it is my duty and responsibility to tell you guys a little about archive uh, we are a, a platform for procure, procuring building materials uh, you can explore materials with us you can connect with professionals just like today that we are doing we can uh, discover a lot of opportunities we are also coming up with some uh, job uh, forums now so students or people who are looking for internships and all you guys will get some good help from us very very soon Apart from that, uh, like today, we are doing a lot of talk series. We have done many, many uh, talk series before this. We have done design talks. We have done material talks uh, where we talk about sustainable materials. We bring in vendors. We bring in architects, experts. So uh, all of this we do. And you can, if you guys have missed out on these events, you will find all of that on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and visit uh, our events. And these are some topics that we have covered. These are just three topics, but you can actually go and watch uh, what all we have for you on YouTube. Do not forget to uh, download the Archive app so that you will always stay connected with us and you will always know how, what are the next events we are coming up with and also a lot about materials. Yes, yeah, so here it is. Uh, this is uh, Amrita Kishore, architect Amrita Kishore. Uh, she is an RIBA nominated architect, a lead green uh, associate and a Griha certified professional. She's pursued a master's from UK and post that she's worked in uh, Dubai as well as England. And in 2020, if I'm not wrong, she's uh, she started Elemental, her own firm. And in a very short time of span, I should I must say, Amruta, that you know you are you are all over the internet. I have read a lot of uh, articles about your work. I have also attended your uh, talk series myself, which is why I thought I could definitely connect with you. So here we have. And before we start this session, guys, like every uh, event, uh, any doubts you have at any point of the presentation, do write other questions in the chat. We will be addressing all these questions at the end of the session when we complete the presentation. So, yes, hope you all enjoy it. Uh, yeah, over to you, Amrita. Thank you so much for that introduction, Samriti. Uh, I'm really happy to be here amongst all of you and share the basics of critical regionalism and climate responsive design. Uh, because in today's world, as I go through the presentation, it's not just like a passing fad. We have uh, come to realize that this is an absolute necessity. And the more of us, architects and non-architects, people who are clients, people who are in similar fields nearby, uh, the more we are all aware of the need for such a thing, um, the more likely we are to reduce the overall carbon footprint due to buildings. So I'll start now. Okay. Sure, so sure. Yes. Slide, um, you can see that there are images of four, uh, four images of cities. Now, are they different cities or are they all one city? Now, if you look at it, if you look at the previous image, it can easily be identified as, um, you know, it can all be like, it might as well be the same city also, but it's really uh, strange to know that they're actually in four different parts of the globe. So the first city on the left, what we have is Mumbai, then we've got Chicago in the USA, then we've got Tokyo in Japan, and then we've got Doha in Qatar. Now, how did this happen? If you go on to the next slide, please. Okay. 
Right. There was a time when our cities would look like this. They were all very, very distinct from each other. And this architectural character, uh, obviously not just made it interesting, like made it unique, but there's also another part of it that we need to come to realize. Now, if you look at it, uh, the first city you can see is Jaisalmer. Then we've got a city in Germany, then somewhere in Japan, and then we've got Sana'a in Yemen. Now, what you can notice here is that uh, they are all unique. And do you know what these are a representation of? Why do these cities look the way they do? Does anyone from the audience have an answer? Like, what is the reason that all of these cities look unique? Anybody? Because they are designed based on their climatic responses, Perfect. using some elements and features. Exactly. So it's all respond, uh, designed very custom based, based on those particular locations. Now you see the one on the leftmost. It's in Jaisalmer, that's in Rajasthan. So what happens there? Basically, they don't receive much rainfall. So you can see that they've got flat roofs. And so does the city in Yemen, that is Sanam, on the far right, which is made out of mud. They're all like four-story structures made purely out of mud. So if you observe, what is the climatic condition there? It's dry, okay, and it's also, uh, uh, it's dry, there is no rainfall, and these are the materials which are available locally. But in case of the city in Japan, you see somebody holding an umbrella walking. So there's a sloping roof. Why is that there? To drain off the rain, which falls there. And similarly, the city in uh, Germany, which is quite cold, there is snowfall. So they've got sloping roofs for this to really drain out. So it's actually that simple about, you know, why these cities look that way. And then the materials they were built uh, were what was locally available. Right. Now we've gone all the way from, now these buildings have, these cities also have a lot of tourist value nowadays, because, you know, you go there, it's like you get transported to a whole new universe. Whereas, you know, if you look at these cities that we saw in the earlier slide, like anywhere you go, it's, uh, I mean, of course, it has its own charm in its own ways, but it's a totally different uh, observation. Right. Now, if you please go on to the next slide, Samrati. No, we're going backwards. Now, there is one aspect, though, that is really missing in the newer cities, and that is called critical regionalism. Now, what that means, like the definition of critical regionalism is that it's a philosophy that preserves local architectural identity, retaining its major functional features, but at the same time meeting global standards. Now, uh, in the second set of, uh, like the second set of images, we know that we cannot have cities which are just like that anymore, like a newly built city, but it's important to identify, like what I said, simple things like yes, rainfall, no rainfall, what does that mean with respect to uh, draining off the water? Uh, like, sorry, what does that mean with respect to architecture? How does it reflect? It's important to understand these basic principles and retain its functional features. But at the same time, we know the technology is advanced, lifestyle has really changed. And in that aspect, we need to really start meeting global standards. So we need to find like a good in between for the best solutions. Uh, so if you can go on to the next slide, please. Right. So now we do like a small case study, right? So we have this image of London uh, on the left, where you can see like these really tall glass towers, very modern, very uh, like, you no, know, the you can look at it and feel the whole bustle of city life very happening. That whole, that's the image that it creates. And if you look at the climatic data for London, the chart on the right says about the average high and the average low temperatures. So the climate in London goes all the way from four degrees Celsius, which is the minimum shown on this image, actually a bit less than that also when there's snowfall, but typically around four degrees Celsius to 23 degrees Celsius. So it's comparatively cooler, okay? Whereas, if you please go on to the next slide, we have Dubai, which has also got these tall towers, a lot of glass. And these also, if you look at the temperature, it ranges from 41 degrees Celsius to 14 degrees Celsius. 
So it's drastically different, right? Like the temperatures. One is extreme is on the colder side, whereas the other one is on the warmer side. Now, how does this reflect? Like when you think about it from the perspective of climate responsive design, how does this reflect? Right. So if you look at it, uh, what is the property of glass? What does the material glass do? It's important to identify, uh, I'm sure all of you know about this phenomenon, it's called greenhouse effect. And what happens is that when you're inside a glass box, right, uh, greenhouses were traditionally built in uh, areas closer to the poles so that they could do cultivation, right? So it's like a building made out of glass. Uh, and when it's extremely cold outside, to have like a balanced temperature to grow plants is how the concept of uh, greenhouse came into place, right? And so that's the general property. So and wherever you place glass, whichever part of the globe, uh, that is exactly how it would work, right? So when you have like a glass building in London, what is the basic thing that you need to identify is that um, it's extremely cold outside. So when a person comes indoors, they want to feel warmer. Right? That is just how, like, if you look at the technical data, like, uh, like psychometric charts and all of that, this is the basic thing that you need to identify. Cold place, you want to come in and feel warmer. So in that space, having a glass box, what happens is that you're able to harness heat and distribute it in this glass space. Okay, and because of that, uh, the overall energy consumed for heating really goes down. So it's definitely uh, logical to have like a glass tower in a place like London. But what happens in spaces like Dubai or more tropical areas, Middle East, uh, parts of India, when you have these huge glass towers, uh, the property of glass doesn't change, right? So it's gonna be a lot of heat gain it's going to be like a lot of heat harnessed into this particular glass box. And what do we need in India? We need to feel cooler indoors than the outdoors as it's pretty hot outside anyway. So when it comes to that aspect, when you come into a glass box, you end up feeling even hotter. So you need to add extra energy. Uh, you need to put in air conditioners. A lot of extra energy is being consumed for AC. Right, so that's a bit of a funny thing, right? You actually heat up the building. It's already hot outside. You heat up the building even more and then you want to cool it. So there is some sort of, uh, the logic is a bit flawed at some point. So this is like a basic thing what people need to keep in mind. But for some reason, all across the globe, like in the cities that we have seen images of, this has been forgotten like at least the time these buildings were built. And I think nowadays there is a lot more awareness coming through. So uh, the rather uh, the designers nowadays have got more edge over it, you know, there's more awareness. The need for climate responsive design is really coming up. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, Amrita, there's a little of question for some interaction with the audience. Uh, this is a question from the audience itself. Uh, climate plays an important role in design, but how efficient or uh, practically viable is it to deal with climate in the modern digital world? Uh, I'm guessing you mean like in terms of architecture, right? Like how it's definitely practically viable and it's... Uh, it's possible to definitely, sorry, <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it's 100% possible to deal with climate with, uh, with changes in architecture in, the, in today's world. Now, for example, now since we have this sort of awareness, there are many techniques that can be used like passive solutions to really uh, reduce the load for heating in buildings. Like but if you're considering uh, the Indian subcontinent and uh, and like one of our projects, which I will be presenting in this presentation, that is the eco house, will give a uh, an example of how this can be done. Okay, so uh, next, what I'm presenting in front of you is a chart that is put together by the 2018 Global Status Report. And this shows how much uh, of greenhouse emissions are produced 
by each of these industries, right? So if you look at the global carbon emissions, you can see that the building operation sector uh, uses 20, like produces 28% of carbon emissions and the building materials and construction industry uh, produces 11%. So totally uh, the building operations and building material and constructions totally produce 39 percentage of global carbon emissions. And this is a huge amount. If you look at it, that is greater than any of the other major industries on the planet. So that shows how big of a change, like the small example I spoke about, about uh, using the right sort of solutions in design. This is how big an impact uh, that professionals who work with building design can create if things are done in a mindful manner, right? So let's go on to the next slide, please. So I'm based in Kerala. Uh, I'm guessing everybody who is listening is all from different parts of India. And my firm, Elemental, we work out of Kerala and we have, uh, this is my, our first project that was completed. It's called the Eco House. And I'm going to be using this as an example to show what it means to be critically regional in the Kerala context. So I'm going to be taking you through it one by one, the different slides. And we can uh, feel free to drop in any of your questions and we'll have like a great Q&A round towards the end of the discussion. Uh, let's go on. So first, before we start understanding the design, it's important to identify the climate data for Kotem in Kerala. That's where the eco house is located, right? So first let's look at the temperatures. Uh, in Kotem, it usually spans from, let's say around 23 degrees Celsius to 33 degrees Celsius. So it's very tropical, very moderate throughout the year. There is a lot of rainfall sometimes, but otherwise it can be quite hot. So if you look at it, this is the uh, hour, temperature data and you can see that most of the time it's warm itself throughout the year and this data can easily be obtained for any city you know from this website called weatherspark.com right uh, let's go on to the next one please and then we have data on rainfall so the months that receive most rainfall in kerala are from june uh, around june june july and august like you can see on the chart on the left and then also a little bit towards the winter time, that is October and November. And if you look at the average monthly rainfall, you can see that it spans from 21 millimeters in Jam to 426 millimeters in June. So yes, so this we need to, uh, the intention of sharing this data is for you to understand how this home responds to these particular aspects, right? So just to keep in mind the context that we are working with. Um, so yes, this is another image of the eco house. And you can see these huge windows all over the place. And what would that mean? That would mean that there is a lot of daylighting, right? If you please go on to the next slide. Right, you can see how lit it is. And how do we save energy here? So when the building is naturally very well daylit, that means there's barely any energy that is being spent on switching on the lights during daytimes, right? So there is no dingy corner. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So if you look at the basic plan of the structure, you can see that there is absolutely no dingy corners inside this inside this house. So the entire area, you unless it's raining really heavily or it's nighttime, you wouldn't need to switch on any lights at all. Next one, please. And the quality of light is really high so that any sort of activity that needs to be carried out, like let's say eating in the kitchen, if it's stitching or cooking, or let's say writing, the quality of light is got the great level, so that- uh, Sorry to interrupt you, Amruta. I think there's some disturbance. Guys, please mute yourself so that you can hear uh, Amruta clearly. I request you all to please mute yourself. Yes. Okay, thank you, Samudhi. Uh, right, yeah. So what I was saying was that, yes, the quality of light is so great that you can use it for all different sorts of activities. Uh, can you please go on to the next slide, please? 
there is daylighting. So again, this is the library area and you can see how, you know, uh, the whole area, it's designed to give that sort of cozy feeling, which is again, like there are a lot of windows around too, so you can leave them open, allow for air to come in, good amount of natural light. That's the basic principle. Uh, that you need to keep in mind when it comes to climate responsive design. Having the, and these are all really simple principles, right? It's, and it's just about being mindful that any building that you design has got these features right in place. Can we go on to the next slide, please? And again, the dining area, you can see the quality of light that's coming in. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, let's take like a small break again. Uh, so we uh, all want to know what is the scope of sustainable architecture in practice? Since you are into it, what scope do you see in this field? Well, I, uh, to be honest, I dream of a day when sustainable architecture becomes the norm really and not uh, like a new thing. Like if all like, so we have a mission, right? Like what we spoke about in terms of global carbon emissions. So ideally, all architects should be considering the factors with respect to sustainability uh, for sure, right? Only then can we actually create a change. And if you were looking at in terms of practice, there are definitely, like I'm saying, like I said, awareness is growing on this topic. And there are definitely a lot of people out there who want uh, to build sustainable. And in fact, for us, as part of Elemental, that's how people approach us when they are aware about sustainability and then they come across our work and if they and they feel like they relate to the concepts that we share that's when uh, that's how people come to us so definitely there is a lot of scope for it i would encourage each and every architect or designer actually every industry in the world right now it needs sustainability right so i really believe that this is the way forward and whichever industry you're in it's definitely uh, the scope of this is only going to rise. And yes. Thank uh, you so much, Amruta, for addressing the question. No problem. Okay. So then we speak about solar heat gain. Now, usually, like for the example of the uh, glass buildings we spoke about, right? We spoke about how when there is a lot of glass, there is a possibility of a lot of heat gain. And in terms of eco house, that's what we saw first, a lot of windows. So how does that compact heat gain? Like how is this problem solved here? Now, what we have done uh, in terms of the eco house is that we have given the right sort of solar shading to combat this problem. So in the image, the section on the right side, on the left side, sorry, what you can see is that the roof, it usually sun trees typically extend around 0.6 meters from the wall, whereas the, uh, these, what you see on the, um, like what you can see here, it extends around 1.5 meters from the walls. And you know that it's efficient because in the image on the right side, you can see how big a shadow this creates on the surface, right? And that's huge. Uh, and because of that, the kind of lighting that comes in is called indirect light. There's no direct, not much of direct heat from the sun, uh, sun rays that act on the interiors of the building. And there's also another feature that helps this, uh, to combat this possible issue. If you can please go on to the next slide. Right. Uh, another reason the way this has been tackled, like if you can look at the section uh, and you see number four, that's the same. Uh, you can see that there is a concrete structure, which is like a shell structure. Uh, we call it a cup roof here. And above that, we have these trusses. Like you, if, if you look at the image on the right, you can see that there are these particular trusses. And above that, it's completely, you know, slope on both sides. So between these exterior slope and the flat bit inside, uh, there is a gap. Okay, so what happens is that the incident rays on the roof, uh, the heat is not, I mean, because there is a truss in between and there's an air cavity, heat is not directly transferred to the cement, the concrete roof, right? And because there's an air cavity all across, there's air flowing all through. And this is an example of exactly how it's done. The image in the middle, 
uh, if you see it, it's got the dining room and it's got a deck to the left side. Whereas in the next image, you see the deck and the whole same space outside. Um, and you can see how the slope has been laid out, right? So because of this cavity also, it's there all throughout the building, there's very less exposed concrete roofs. Uh, and yeah, because of this cavity all around, there is a lot of uh, the heat from inside the roof is distributed. Next one, please. Another important factor of this building, uh, again, this is how we have responded to this particular site. Uh, how we compact heat gain is also due to orientation of the structure. So first, let me tell you a bit about how the site has been laid out. So if you notice, there is uh, a flat site. And so this was actually the location of the eco house is actually on top of a hill. And this hill, uh, this site was damaged by its previous owners. They had actually taken the good topsoil from the site and we've sold it, right? So it's like a huge cliff we have on the southern side and on the west uh, eastern side of this property. Now, what has happened is, now if you consider the sun path of the building, uh, the direction of the sun goes all the way from east to west via the south, okay? And the space in between, um, like what happens is the hottest rays of the sun often comes from the southern side. And fortunately for this particular property, even though it is damaged, uh, because of the huge cliff, which is around 12 meters in height on the southern side, the rays of the sun, uh, which are incident on the side, there is a shadow formed by it automatically due to this particular cliff. So on the southern side, even though we have windows, because of the cliff, there is a uh, bit of a barrier that the incident sun rays don't come in. So the building has been designed to complement the site. So that's very important, understanding orientation, understanding the main areas where sunlight comes in from. Otherwise, if it was like a complete flat side on all sides uh, without any other barriers, if you have a lot of glass on the southern side, it's going to get really heated up. So it's about um, like when you are a student of architecture, these are one of the basic things that are taught to us. But it's really about identifying, understanding these basic concepts, which are really simple and implementing it in a mindful way. Right. OK, so then we go on to the concept of orientation again. And now I'm going to be speaking about how we have used it in the right way for ventilation, right? So in the circular side, the most of the wind comes in from the northwestern side. So if you notice the side diagram on the left, you can see how the uh, wind rays are coming in, right? And so if you look at the orientation of the building, uh, it has been placed in such a way that the deck and the huge openings of the building, they are placed in such a way that the cool breeze is harvested inside. Right. So if it was the same house and we had placed, let's say, the deck at the back side, there wouldn't be any wind coming in from there. And you can see that these openings are huge. So and it really cleans up that big voluminous space we have for the living room. Next slide, please. And another important aspect that's been considered is cross ventilation. So all through the building, there is a glass that there are these glass windows and they've all been placed in such a way that if you open them out, there is great cross ventilation throughout the rooms. So in a space like Kerala, where it can get really hot, having good air movement really uh, supports, save, uh, like really supports the people who are inside, switching on a fan, you know what bigger difference that can make. So similarly, when harnessing the right amount of wind from site and letting it flow through really helps make the space feel a lot more comfortable. Then another strategy um, that we have used, I see a question come in. So we'll go through it at the end. It's good that you put it out so that you don't forget it. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next uh, strategy that we have put in place is called the wind tower. So if you look at the image on the top, on the left side, 
you can see this small roof on top of this building, which has got a small opening. Now, if you look at this section, how it's been designed is that that particular opening, it's got these cavities on four sides like windows, but it does not have any glass. It's just got grill and mosquito mesh. And how this works is like this is the wind exhaust tower. So we all know the basic concept that hot air rises. Now, what happens here is that hot air rises all the way to the top here. Uh, like naturally it would. So this particular wind tower is the highest point of the entire building. And the height, the opening space that has been calculated to understand that, uh, so the concept is this, when there is, a, when there is an opening at a higher level, uh, due to the pressure out difference between the inside and outside of the building, uh, hot air automatically rises. So there's automatically a st stack effect that happens. So essentially any part of this house, if there is an opening and there's an inlet for air, this due to the high pressure, the pressure difference, the wind tower on top would be an outlet to let air pass through. Next slide, please. Apart from this, if you look at the bedroom uh, in all, all four of the bedrooms in the house, uh, we have used these bedroom exhaust systems. Now, usually what happens is that there are exhausts kept in toilet to take out the odor. But what we have done here is that there is an exhaust fan placed in between the bedroom and the toilet. So it works in two ways. And from the toilet, there are just these lures to the outside. So how it works is that there is, uh, when it gets heated up inside the rooms, right? So you, if once we close the bedroom doors, it's not connected to the wind tower anymore. What happens is that um, the hot air again rises and the exhausts are placed in such a point where this hot air is sucked out mechanically, right? So this wouldn't be a passive solution, it's actually an active solution. And it also works in two ways. Since it's on the bathroom door, uh, we can see that this hot air, uh, uh, like we can also use it when, while using the toilet. So it's a two-way solution. Next slide, please. And next we've got the kitchen. Now the kitchen, which is number 10 in plan, you can see that there is a courtyard next to it, which is numbered as number 11. And it's got, a, uh, the courtyard has got just again, mosquito mesh and grill for covering. So any heat inside the kitchen goes out by itself on, uh, through the courtyard. So any of the smells in the kitchen or heat in the kitchen, kitchens tend to get really heated up because we are right there, like, because there is this fire and, you know, cooking and all of that. So all the heat produced in the kitchen automatically goes out. If you see these grills, there are no, uh, there's no glass there, it's just grill. So it automatically goes out. And then because of the courtyard, you can also see the rains when you're cooking and all of that. So it it really cools down the entire space. Uh, and yes, we go on to the materiality. So it's made out of burnt clay bricks. So if you look at the materials nowadays available nearby in Kerala, in Kerala, the best material that can be used if you have uh, it available in stock nearby is laterite stone. But the locality where the house, is, the eco house is based, it's uh, in Kottiam and there isn't much of laterite around. So what happens is that we've used burnt clay bricks for this process. Now, usually nowadays around, um, around our locality, it's mostly cement blocks that are being used, but we have insisted and we have built the entire structure of burnt clay bricks like in the olden times. And the reason for this is because of the property of cement blocks for absorbing heat. Uh, it's, cement has got high thermal mass, so it absorbs heat during daytime and gives it out during nighttime. But when you're using a mud-based material such as burnt clay bricks, the amount of heat absorbed uh, into the structure is comparatively less. Uh, next slide, please. And like I said earlier, there is a minimum exposed concrete that can that is there in our structure, except for this garage roof on one end. There is barely any exposed concrete. Next slide, please. And the structure is completely minimal. We, you can see that we don't have any false ceilings. Uh, it's all just way it's kept as raw as possible. It's finished in a nice way. 
but we don't have any ornamental elements, elements which are there just for ornamentation. Next slide, please. And yes, the mangrove tiles used on the roof have got no extra coating. And what this means is that, that again, the clay property of the mangrove tiles, it helps take out the, uh, like bring in only limited heat. Next slide, please. Let's take up one more question. Uh, so what kind of research is done to make a structure climate responsive? I think you have covered a lot of all this, but uh, maybe if you have to summarize this, what is the kind of research one has to do? So there is always uh, a lot of lessons to really learn from tradition. So it's good to uh, really identify, like first of all, research on the climate of the locality, understand it well, understanding the site context, and the third thing would be to do maybe a bit of research about how traditional buildings in the area operated, right? Not to like, let's say copy paste it, but to identify what are the features from it which were really sensible and really responsive to the climate. Uh, because you must remember that, okay, with global warming now, temperatures have risen, but even then, uh, the general characteristic of the area, there was a time where people lived without electricity. And if they had to live comfortably in this particular location, how did they do it? So there is a bit of research that is required on traditional practices too, so that they can be, uh, maybe the right lessons can be taken away from them. Right. <laughs> Now we go on to the sustainable lifestyle bit. So in our property, uh, we have adopted certain measures to allow for more a more sustainable lifestyle. The first thing that has been included on site is a solar water heater so that there is no extra energy consumed for heating. Okay. Uh, then the second aspect that we have considered is the rainwater harvesting. Um, so this is now a rule in Kerala as well that a house of above a certain area has got to have rainwater harvesting. And I think this is something that is really going to come up in the next, you know, few years for sure. The next aspect is that the, the waste, the vegetarian, the uh, food waste on site is decomposed and uh, composted. And that same food that the manure we create from it is then used for the different plants and uh, plants on site. Now on site, we've uh, put in a lot of food trees. We're trying to follow a garden to plate system, but a lot of vegetables consumed by uh, the family living in the house are produced on site itself. And we allow, we've promoted maximum number of local species because it directly responds to the climate uh, needs the right sort of rainfall and so on and so forth. And then the final uh, icon, what we have considered is that uh, as a firm, we generally uh, do not, you know, support our clients if they want to do any damage to the site. We really believe that terrains should be left the way it is in terms of eco house. Uh, we did not have the fortune of that because as the client bought the site, it is already damaged. But we also uh, promote the thought that let contour sites stay contoured. And there are a lot of reasons for those. It's first of all, it's about water drainage. Water really needs to seep in through the topsoil and go down to the groundwater reserves. Because only then, like if all these topsoil is removed from different parts of, you know, of sites like nowadays, um, in Kerala, what I can see is that people really want to have a flat plot. It might be on top of a hill, but they want a flat plot. Like that is like a fad at the moment. And I feel really uh, that that's not a great way of, that's not a great approach because that means you're damaging that much of the environment. And if everybody starts to do that, th there would be no possibility of water going back into the soil, having, making sure that your site allows for water seepage into the soil is what would ensure that there is water in the wells in the coming years right so it's all interlinked and that's the main thing that i'd like to share about climate responsive architecture or sustainable architecture.
it in general about it's all about mindfulness about being mindful about the different resources and if you look at it it's very simple you have sunlight great sunlight harness it into daylighting if you've got great uh, water in the area harness it make it into a form where you can use it for consumption if you have so much rain let's harness it use it for in terms of eco house they use it for watering the plants all around uh, there are also possible to have systems where rainwater harvested is recycled and it's shared throughout the property like for flushing um and so on and so forth right and that's a huge amount of water that can be conserved due to this process so yes uh, it's all about mindfulness it's about really being aware of these very simple concepts that i've just shared with you and putting it together in the right form uh, shall we go on to the next slide Yes, Samrita. Uh, that was definitely a very informative session. Uh, the presentation is over, but not the session. We have questions, and uh, you guys can put up your questions in the chat while I just run you through our app again. So, if you install Archive, this is what our app will look like. You will have all your trending materials, sustainable materials, all kinds of materials, and uh, this is how you can place direct quotes with us. to vendors you will have quotations from several vendors at one time and you can actually understand uh, the market price and you can compare it with your uh, the vendors that you know so you can buy materials from us you can connect with professionals this is just a screenshot of how uh, and what our app will look like once you download it so i request you all again to please uh, go through our app and uh, take the maximum benefit of it also events like these you will be updated you will get your notifications time to time uh, when the event is starting and when you can register and all of it so do not miss out on that and yes we will take up all your questions i hope you guys are uh, putting in all your questions in the chat and uh, till i take up the questions these are uh, our contact details for elemental as well as for rakhi hive you can reach out to amrita you can reach out to her firm also uh, you can watch her instagram handle and uh, watch her work there uh, she has a lot going on there on aki hive you guys have our contact details for any kind of support for any kind of queries you have regarding our app we are always here to solve it and uh, noted down guys till till i take up all your questions so yeah amrita i think there okay. are pretty many questions we have to look at yes so let's start from the big name yeah uh, vishali is first yes. asked he talked yes. about so, air yeah camp. i can take up the question so till then you can sure. think about it yes so vishali hi vishali so the question from vishali is uh, about the air cavity so mm -hmm. uh, about the air cavity but in view it's almost flat so i think she's talking about your in the image that we showed right it's actually not fully flat if you can please go back to that slide sure uh, okay after all that okay let's go a bit further i think this one next slide yeah okay cool no no, no just the previous one this previous. is enough please wait oh, wait wait no the one after this okay yeah perfect perfect 24 that's the one okay so i'm going to just explain this geometry once again uh if you could take the cursor to number 4 yeah perfect okay so now this particular room is what you see in the image at the bottom right so you in the section you can see how the slope is right so it's got a small slope there is a flat portion in between and there is another slope on the side on the right if you can just move your cursor along somebody along with me that yeah. would be really helpful in room yeah. number 4 if you look at the ceiling like there is a particular way the slope has been aligned not the ceiling not the roofing on top like there is that there's a there's a slope a flat area and a slope again and if you look at the image below you can see exactly how that's done it's a wall slope flat area slope right so it's not flat at all it's more of a uh, it's another shape it's like a dome but without the curve to some extent right but the same structure like in the image at the bottom you see the uh, deck outside 
left on the left at the bottom <laughs> i think there's a some a time lag with yeah. yeah right okay i'm going to say it once again so basically in the image at the bottom uh there is uh like you can see the deck and in the image on the right the same deck is there but when you look at the structure from outside it's a slope right so that's where you no know, it's a flat area and the slope is how the cavity has been placed hope that answers your question okay uh, uh okay i do have the questions open on the other end i'll take up the next question amrita mm. sneha what solution would be proposed instead of pitched roof cavity in case of flat roofs how to create cavity and make sure direct solar heat doesn't get uh, get in while in case of flat roofs so first of all uh if you are building in the kerala context uh i think it would be smarter to not have a flat roof at all like unless your client is really really particular uh the thing about architecture the main challenge an architect always has to face is to convince their clients and if it's someone who is genuinely interested in uh, sustainability it's about making them aware about the differences when you have flat roofs there's also a risk of you know water leakage and all of that when you have these double layer roof uh that problem becomes you know a lot more better right but i'll just continue the second part how to create cavity make sure direct solar heat now there are two different things that has been approached here so when when we speaking about solar heat that's about the solar shading right so uh if you don't want to have a sloping roof it's again a flat solar shading that you need to put into place calculate it properly there are a lot of simulation softwares right there used to be ecotech at the point of time i'm not sure if it's there anymore there's something called sephira pro so model out your projects on let's say revit or sketchup and you can install these plugins and that will really help you identify uh, how much solar heating you are able to provide in your design it's again a very basic logic like i said more shade in the right direction will really uh, give another solution and how to create cavity so in another project of ours which we are working on in the north of kerala in kannur uh we have created a double cavity within a flat roof because that is what was needed by the client uh and we've done that with the help of these particular metal rods again like similar to the box sections that is used for the truss and above that we have these other uh flat layer put in place with the right sort of drainage so it's all about creating those two layers and the right kind of air cavity in between that's the concept okay Thank you, Amrita. Uh, let's take up the next question. Will the odor come towards the room as the exhaust is connected to the bedroom? Right. So the answer is no, not at all. Because if you look at it, so think about it is there is one wall and there is another one with a few openings, right? That is the um, what do you call it? The um, what is the word? Basically, uh, it's the uh, ventilator and it's got these louvers. on it so right? it's always open so when there is air being pushed from one direction to the other the exhaust is working the air is being pushed from one side and there is an opening like suppose this is the wall air is being pushed here and there is a second wall here obviously the air flow is only going to be outside so i think to fit like a room the people are all jam packed there is one exit so when there are more people coming in automatically people get pushed out right so that's the whole logic that's how the whole pressure system works so the order will by no chance come into the main bedroom okay hope that answers your question vishali uh, next question from vishaka what would you have done for thermal comfort if there was wasn't any cliff on the southern side <laughs> if there was no <laughs> cliff on the southern side this design would have been completely different there wouldn't have been this uh this house would have looked like something else completely right now if there is no cliff on southern side that means the number of openings on south would reduce possibly it might become one story there or like let's say if we're able to give the right sort of trees for shading it's a completely new uh, context that we would be working for 
and it would have to have its own sort of solutions, maybe keeping a lot of secondary areas, like let's say bathrooms, storerooms, all of that on the southern wall. That's also a solution that can be obtained. So the main living spaces are always kept a bit cooler. Okay. Okay, we have two more questions right now. Uh, guys, if you have any more questions, please put it in the chat. I'm taking up uh, by the order. Uh, next question is from Akhi Vinayak. Uh, he is asking you what were the major challenges you faced in this project? Well, um, so for this project, uh, I was very fortunate to start off with a client who was very close to me and, you know, I did not have too much of a problem in explaining the concept and identifying how it should be. Right. The major challenges would obviously be, I feel as any architect, to make sure that what you have designed is what is being built on site. Uh, it Again, we are a team, we, we do just design, we don't do turnkey projects. So ensuring that the right sort of output comes through is a big challenge and you know, it required a lot of time spent on site and the right sort of dedication. So yeah, that, that was the major challenge that we faced. And then again, um, on site, there was also another problem of water logging. Uh, because the site was damaged, right? Like instead of a slope, it was now like really cut through. There was no topsoil. So in certain parts of the site, there was also a waterlogging issue. So we had to design in such a way that we don't make the problem worse. We leave those particular spots empty. And then we let water flow through. Uh, we put in the right channels for water to flow out through the, you know, on site. And not like, you know, really remain in this site. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question, how the RCC slab and sloping Mangalore tiles are joined with each other? Okay, how are they joined? So this, they are joined with truss work. So uh, what we've used is we've got these metal sections of one inch by four inch. They are these uh, rectangular sections. So we've created entire trusses out of them. So there is the slab, uh, let's say the sloping slab. There is a bit of a truss work on top. And only above that, the, the clay tiles have been made. So there is an entire air cavity uh, connected throughout. All right. Uh, another question from Avilasha. Uh, can we have heighted boundary wall on the southern side to avoid direct glare to a certain extent? Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. But it's about identifying the cost for that. Because most of the time in our products, cost is the biggest problem. So we can have a heighted boundary wall, uh, but remember the, think of the material that this boundary wall is made out of. If it is, let's say, made out of mesh and a lot of creepers through, that's okay, right? It doesn't give out any heat. But if it's a wall made out of cement blocks, for instance, that will by itself radiate a lot of heat onto our structure, making it, you know, uh, yeah, like that's it. So just keep, be mindful about this one fact, yeah. Okay. okay, Priya Darshini has a little out of the way question. Uh, she says she's attended your uh, class in uh, Design for List and wants to do master's in sustainable architecture in Nottingham. Can you give her suggestion, some suggestion? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, Priya Darshini. You can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'll get back to you and we can discuss this. Not a problem. All right. Uh, next question coming up from Vishali. Kerala has high humidity. What are some of the strategies to deal with a high humidity? Have you considered it in your project? So, uh, the, yes, this is obvious. This is a big problem for sure. Now, humidity particular in the, now, if you look at the location of eco house, it's a bit more moderate. The areas near the coast have faced this problem like crazy. Okay. And what we in case of eco house, not so much because the levels are pretty okay, but this humidity problem is really something that we're facing. Uh, we have, there is a firm that I came across, uh, like we've never had to work with such a thing yet, but uh, I'll share with you what I know. There's a firm that I came across recently. They were trying these methods of, you know, uh, really cooling, like evap something like uh, having these water flow, like these water curtains and, you know, so that the heat and all that was coming in was being 
tackled by itself. But again, this is a topic, uh, something that I myself am also trying to find a solution to. I don't have an act, a passive solution yet. I do know that people have designed something called dehumidifiers. So it's like, like, like an AC, but instead of cooling, what it does, it actually sucks out the humidity. So it, I know that it works sort of reverse to the AC. Like AC really like uses water cools and pushes the cold air in, whereas here they suck out the heat content into the system. But as for passive solutions, uh, that's something that I haven't been able to really get like solid insight on yet to be very honest but like you know if any of you have a good solution for this uh i'd really appreciate it if you can share it too because uh this is the kind of information we all really need right yes definitely uh thank you uh okay there's next question coming up from manoj uh finding a home seismic analysis is necessary in which regions Correct. So if you look at um, the data, as so I mentioned this website called weatherspark.com. Uh, so it also talks about the different areas. It's about understanding which areas are prone to earthquakes and which are not really. So uh, getting this data from these data banks is very important uh, to identify where, whether or not your area is prone to. Um, seismic attacks and if it is it's also important to design accordingly all right i think we've exhausted the questions if any more questions as we're here for another uh, two to five minutes uh, amrita one question from my side uh, this is uh, so all we've spoken about climate responsive is regarding the exterior uh, majorly, like what can be done for interiors? Are there any minimal solutions you think that can you know help with climate responsiveness or something like that? Any solutions? Yeah, there is actually a course that I have on design of policy, which is a recorded course. Uh, oh. One is on sustainable interior design, one is on sustainable architecture. So yeah, I, uh, that's like a whole four module long session, but very basic things that I can share with you right now is first of all, the materiality. And again, about identifying, like for example, if you look at, let's say an image of a resort in Goa, it will all have these very, you know, chairs made out of coils, chairs that will make you sweat when you sit down. Whereas if you look at a building, which is in, let's say Himachal, there might be a lot of leather, a lot of fur, you know, the kind of material you use itself is very different than the kind of shading, the, if the sort of curtains, the materials you use for that, the kind of materials you, it's again, very it's a completely very, huge vast of uh, study. Yeah, yeah. But it's again, the concept, the baseline of the concept is extremely simple. It's about the weather outside. Is it cold or hot? And how do you want to feel inside? Do you want to feel colder or hotter? And it's all about selecting the right things. It's as easy as your clothing. You wouldn't wear the same clothes in summer and winter. Correct. 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 So it's the same way. So how would you want your interiors to be? It's all depending on that. Then areas of high humidity, it can't have material like too much of leather and all of that because that might get damaged. Whereas a material like coil would be more suitable. So it's all about just being mindful of this one topic. And there is a lot Correct. of detail yes. to it in uh like for example let's consider the color of paint on your wall how much daylight do you want it's all again context based i like you know what do you want the end product to be feeling as so right. yes right. there is a complete course on it uh but this but i think if you have this one thought in your mind that would create like a proper track to find the right solutions Right. Okay. So this is there on design policy, you, you're saying. Ha, 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 ha. Correct. Okay. So guys, yeah, another interesting session that you can, we got some free information here. So yeah. one of that as well. Uh, okay, guys, I think we don't have any more questions. We've exhausted all. I think any more questions, guys, if you want to unmute yourself or something, you can do that. Wait for a minute. Right. I don't think there are any more questions. If there are any, reach out to Amrita or even us, we will get you through.
and amrita thank you so much for uh, sparing some time from your busy schedule it was great having you Hopefully thank you samriti works out we will also have a different session on interiors again let's <laughs> talk but thank you for being there thank you so much yeah. thank you great to meet all of you digitally right have all a great right, time all the best bye bye